Hi everyone, I would like to thank the Department of Art History and Cultural Practices at Manchester for the invitation and particularly to Ed Book and Charlie Miller. Today I'm going to talk about the German-Argentinian photographer Greta Stern. I will focus on her series of photographs of indigenous people from the Chaco region in northern Argentina taken between 1958 and 1964. Compared to her well-known portraits of leading intellectuals and cultural figures of the 20th century, like Bertolt Brecht, Karl Korsch or Jorge Luis Borges, or her photo montages for the magazine Idilio, Stern's Chaco photographs did not seem to occupy a central place in her work for the critics. This has changed slightly in recent years, as exemplified by exhibitions at Fundación Proa in Buenos Aires in 2005, and at Berlin's Ethnological Museum in 2010-2011. In 2005, a selection of Stern's images was published under the title Aborígenes del Gran Chaco, which included a critical study by photography historian Luis Priamo, along with texts on indigeneity by anthropologists José Antonio Pérez Goyan and Pablo Wright. Most critics argue that Stern's Chaco's images can be seen as the quintessential convergence of her aesthetic and ethical ideas and concerns. On the one hand, the modernist or avant-gardist approach to photography, on the other, the humanist preoccupation with the fate of oppressed and persecuted people. This interpretation, I argue, is instrumental in articulating a particular narrative that connects these representations of indigenous people with Stan's earlier experiences, both as a Jew during the rights of the Nazis in Germany and as a, an exponent and introducer of the Bauhaus style in Argentina. In this presentation, I want to suggest an alternative reading of this uh, photographic series, mainly by shifting the focus from Stan's figure to the photographs themselves locating them in relation to a history of visual representations of Argentina's indigenous cultures. I will start with a brief biographical sketch of Stern, then I will discuss the relationships between visuality and indigeneity in the Chaco area, looking particularly at the role of photography during its colonization by the Argentinian state at the turn of the 20th century. I will then return to Stern to analyze how these images introduce a rupture with the visuality of the Gran Chaco, contributing, contributing to the aestheticization of Chaqueño indigenous communities. Grete Stern was born in Elberfeld, Germany, in 1904. Between 1923 and 1925, she studied graphic arts at the State Academy of Fine Arts in Stuttgart. Afterwards, she studied photography with Walter Peterhans and in 1930 opened a graphic design and photography studio in Berlin with her friend Ellen Oyerbach, another of Peterhans' students. In 1932, she enrolled at the Bauhaus Photography Workshop in the South, but her studies were cut short when the institution closed a year later under pressure from the Nazis. Stern, who was a leftist and a Jew, decided to emigrate to London with her brother. In 1935, she married Argentinian photographer Horacio Coppola, whom she had met at the Bauhaus, and the following year the couple settled in Argentina, where they quickly became the reference of modern photography in the country, introducing many of the principles of the Bauhaus school, particularly those associated with the Neue Sehen, or new vision movement. Neue Sehen regarded photography as an autonomous artistic practice with its own rules of lighting and composition, and the lens of the camera was considered a second eye for gazing at the world. This new way of seeing was expressed in the use of unexpected framings and high and low camera angles and the search for contrast in form and light. In 1943, Stern made her first individual exhibition and divorced Coppola. She continued to work as a photographer and educator in Argentina, and in 1959 she made her first trip to the province of Chaco, in the northeast, to teach photography at the local university. In 
It was during this state that she developed the idea of making a photographic series about the local indigenous people. Since I intend to situate Stern's project within a history of visuality of Chaqueño indigeneity, it is important to discuss the place of the Gran Chaco in the Argentinian imaginary of race. The Gran Chaco is a great plain of over 600,000 square kilometers that combines low elevations and moderate depressions, covering areas of Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay and Brazil. The fact that Chaqueño indigenous groups were not an easy source of labor force, combined with the lack of gold and silver in the region, implied that during the time of the Spanish Empire, the area remained a very low priority for the crown. This situation did not experience many transformations after Argentina became independent from Spain in the second decade of the 19th century, partly due to the fragility of the central government of the new country and the internal struggles between different factions of our nation building. And so the Gran Chaco continued to be one of the last autonomous indigenous regions in the Americas. The situation changed in 1880 when a group of liberal landowners managed to impose its, uh, its vision of a nation building and the political and economic structures of the modern Argentinian nation state finally started to consolidate, ending decades of civil war and political violence. This process of national affirmation was funded on three fundamental and interrelated principles. The first one was the expansion of the capitalist frontier to insert Argentina firmly into the world economy as a supplier of raw materials for the industrialized countries of the North, mainly the United Kingdom with which it developed a very close relationship, to the point that historian and journalist Andrew Graham Yu referred to Argentina as the forgotten British colony. The second principle was the definition of geopolitical borders, particularly in those areas with little or no state control, such as Chaco in the north and Patagonia in the south, where indigenous communities continued to live in relative autonomy. The third principle was the attraction of European immigrants who were supposed to settle in these new territories that were going to be seized from indigenous groups. Their task was to transform these territories into productive lands precisely for the agro-capitalist economy that Argentina was in the process of establishing. After successfully annexing the territories in the south, in Patagonia, in 1879, the Argentinian state launched in 1884 a fully-fledged military campaign that succeeded in occupying the southern Chaco and seriously undermined indigenous resistance. In the following years, successive military campaigns, the growth of sugar plantations and sawmills, and the promotion of white settlements of firm state sovereignty and capitalist expansion over the Argentinian Chaco and seriously deteriorated indigenous people's traditional livelihoods. Most of them were forcefully integrated into the nation's structures as workers in the plantation system, often in slave-like conditions. During the course of the 20th century and up to today, the destructive frontier continued to expand in the Argentinian Chaco, leading to environmental devastation and further destruction of indigenous ways of living. This area has consistently ranked among the uh, most deprived regions in Argentina, with indigenous people being their poorest inhabitants. But going back to the first decades of the 20th century and the process of internal colonization of the Chaco by the Argentinian state, I want to address the role of photography in this process. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the emergence of modern physiognomy in Europe transformed the human body into a materiality ready for formal reading and examination. 
giving way to the elaboration of modern theories of racial difference. Its development into a principle of equivalence and categorization centered on the notion of type contributed to this by establishing the idea that phenotypical variation was a signifier of race. This was a difference that could be organized to the point that each subject was deemed representative of all the attributes of a specific race and comparable to others within the same racial group. Photography legitimized these notions thanks to its alleged transparency and realism and provided a format on which the logic of typification and quantification was a visible reality. Simultaneously, it disseminated and popularized biological racism through the circulation and consumption of representations of non-white people within a transnational visual economy of race. During the turn of the 20th century, Argentina was eager to present itself as a modern nation in tune with the latest scientific paradigms and currents. It invested heavily in establishing scientific institutions, being the Museo de la Plata, or La Plata Museum, founded in 1883, the most prominent. The Argentinian government also sought to attract European scientists with generous salaries, substantial funding schemes, and opportunities to be in direct contact with material deemed precious in scientific terms, like geological or paleontological fossils and exotic flora and fauna from the New World. To this list, it is possible to add indigenous cultures, which were presented as living relics from a prehistoric age, soon to disappear due to the unstoppable force of European civilization being unfolded in Argentina. During the colonization of the Chaco by the Argentinian state, local indigenous communities were the objects of significant photographic production as part of the development of a specific visuality of the region and its native inhabitants. This was partly the work of anthropologists, particularly the head of the anthropology section at La Plata Museum, Robert Lehmann Nietzsche, and the museum's entomologist Karl Bruch both German. As can be seen in these images, they basically reproduce the conventions of anthropometric photography. The subjects were portrayed in standardized poses, in full frontal and side, naked or half naked, against an empty background that made their physical features stand out, and with a measuring stick. These images that you can see are very shocking and hard to see, but I think it's important to show them in order to understand the intrinsic link between photography, science, and violence and racism during the colonization of the Chaco and other regions under indigenous control at the turn of the 20th century in Argentina. The La Plata Museum also kept indigenous people as prisoners to be observed and studied, and some were never released and died on the premises of the institution. This production of authorized visual knowledge about indigeneity in the Chaco was at times anticipated and at times parallel to the work of professional photographers like Guido Bojani, Samuel Rimacé, Harry Grants All and Hans Manns, all foreigners as you can see, who explored the Gran Chaco in search of images for the flourishing market of ethnic postcards and cards de visite. Deborah Poole states that commercial photography was complementary and in many cases indistinguishable from anthropological photography. During the late 18th century and early 20th century, postcards and cards de visite of indigenous people as industrially produced image objects could be accumulated and displayed 
by the transnational bourgeoisie in the same way as any other commodity or collectible. The mass circulation and consumption in Argentina and abroad consequently allowed the dissemination of popular images of the Chaqueño Amerindian as a commodified, nameless and dehistoricized other. As the example that you can see indicate, these photographs mainly conform to the primitivist tropes fashionable at the time nakedness, painted faces, exotic animals and landscape, at times incorporated elements from anthropometric photography to their more aestheticized form. And I think at this point, when discussing ethnic postcards, it is important to avoid a monolithic view of the relationships between the photographer and the photograph. Complex negotiations could uh, uh, take place between the two, which sometimes resulted in consent and at times in refusal. However, it is unquestionable that these negotiations occurred in highly unequal terms. The purpose of this genealogy of photography of the Chaco and its indigenous inhabitants is to insert Stern's work within a particular history of regionalized and racialized visuality and to assess it in terms of continuities and ruptures with this visual imaginary. Simultaneously, I want to move away from readings that put all the emphasis on Stern himself and focus exclusively on notions such as avant-gardism and authorship. So let's now look at Stern's work in the Chaco. Her first experience in the region was in 1958 in the city of Resistencia on a contract with the recently created National University of the Northeast. The institution was establishing an ethnographic museum and archive to which Stern was to contribute with photographs of landscapes and communities. This two month stay sparked her interest in the local indigenous population and culture. She photographed indigenous people from the Toba ethnicity living in the outskirts of the city, as well as examples of their pottery, weaving and basketry. She returned to Resistencia in 1959, this time for a year and again hired by the university which had decided to start a local art workshop and residency. An album of around 56 by 6 contact prints of photographs taken during this period was published as a result of this experience. These early images show how, from the very beginning, Stem was already departing from previous portrayals of the Chaqueño Amerindian by applying the principles of the Bauhaus and the Neue Sechen movement to these photographic subjects and themes. A good example is this portrait of a cacique or indigenous leader or chief called Antonio Gomez. We can see how the natural light in a 45 degree angle above the subject focuses on his facial expression to present him as conveying what, according to Stern, were the attributes of a leader, wisdom and authority. This approach was coherent with her theory that portrait photography should capture the person's essence. Stern soon started to work on a proposal for a more ambitious venture focusing on six areas of interest, landscapes, housing, clothing, lifestyle and living standards, facial features and craft. However, the implementation of the project was delayed due to her decision to avoid public funding. Given the appalling conditions in which indigenous people were living due to state neglect and racism, it is possible to speculate that she feared restrictions would be imposed on the project by public institutions. Only in 1964, 
and after obtaining state funding from the Fondo Nacional de las Artes that guaranteed complete artistic control, Stem went back to the Gran Chaco. She was now age 60. The project's rationale, initially intended to document the Toba and Mokobi populations in Resistencia and Villa Angela, which she had photographed in previous visits, was now expanded to encompass other localities and indigenous communities. On her return to Buenos Aires after three months, Stern organized an exhibition with 189 images, which was initially presented at the San Martin Cultural Center in Buenos Aires. Stern's Chaco series has been hailed as one of the first examples of photographic essay in Argentina. Seen in this way, one could describe the particular narrative of the series as one in which the implied spectator, white, educated and urban, is confronted with communities in the process of transculturation, with traditional practices and customs cohabiting with the transformations brought about by state and capital. Portrayals of weaving or of people foraging show the remains of old Amerindian style. At the same time, the presence of Western clothes or of Christianity, which is exemplified by images of people attending religious services or holding Bibles as a form of protection from the camera, all of these indicate the impact of colonization. This impact is also visible in the depiction of individuals living in extreme poverty conditions. Many subjects, particularly witchy, are wearing tattered garments, living in very precarious huts, or hand working the fields at a time in which mechanized agriculture was common. Despite these tensions present in the photographs, Stern always refused to politicize her work and claim, quote, I have not gone into the subject myself. I simply photograph what I saw, end of quote. This statement reflects a willingness to move away from any possible reading of the photographs in terms of the rising emancipatory discourses of the Latin American left of the time, and particularly those influenced by Mariategui's model of indigenous-based Marxism, Instead, she positions her work closer to a humanistic ethics, more concerned with universal moral values than with the concrete and localized present and past struggles of these communities. In other words, what drives her work is the possibility of building instances through which empathy with the photographic subjects could emerge. And this is a big contrast with uh, some of the trends in Latin American art at the time that sought to create a political consciousness in the spectator in order to transform him or her into an active agent in revolutionary struggle to precisely overcome the type of social injustice portrayed in Stern series. Although Stern occasionally used 35 mm film, she took most of her Chaco photographs using a Yashica Mat 6x6 camera. The preference for a medium format and monochrome color are indicative that Stern's concern was careful composition rather than spontaneity. This is also symptomatic in the fact that she frequently used a tripod. However, as Mention these images break with the rigidity of anthropometric photography and accentuate the traits already present in her 1959-1960 images of Chaqueño indigeneity. This is particularly visible in her portraits, a type of photograph that features prominently in the series. Most of these portrait photographs tend to favor low-angle shots and in many cases, the subjects deliberately turn their face from the camera as a statement of resistance to the disciplinary power of the gaze. 
Here we have two examples of that. On the left hand side, we have the photograph of an unidentified Mokobi man. And the subject's face turned towards the right, imposing itself over the spectator with an air of autonomy and self possession marked by the soft uniform light, the prominence of the figure, and the absence of eye contact with the viewer. On the right hand side, we have a photograph of an identified Toba woman, and the effect, the effect is in this case further enhanced by the smile. The low angle shot and her facial expressions contrast with the objectifying tendency of anthropometric photography, thus humanizing the photographic subject. In both cases, the figure ground organization is central. The background underscores the person's physical features, but contrary to anthropological photographs, in this case, it's not physical characteristics and phenotypes as signifiers of race that come to the fore, but rather the full expression of the face. It is precisely this expressiveness that allows affect to emerge. Through this, this Images fall from the face as an interface that demonstrate the singularity of the subject, in contrast with the notion of the Amerindian as a representative of a racial type in anthropometric photography. Although undoubtedly visual anthropology manifested certain attention to aesthetics, the break introduced by Stern's images is profound because they construct the Amerindian primarily as an aestheticized figure rather than an object of scrutiny. Through this particular aestheticization, expressed in angles and framings reminiscent of the Bauhaus and the Neue Sechen, these images resist the absorption by the hegemonic visuality of the Chaqueño Amerindian. The preeminence of subjectivity and affect in these images suggests the possibility of identification between the viewer and the photographic subject, which contrasts with the distance and objectification of previous images, like the ones I shown at the beginning of this presentation. It is important to know, however, that this break is not exempt from certain problematic aspects. Stern's annotation show a certain persistence of normative elements since most of those photographs, except community figures, chiefs, religious leaders, are described in terms of their ethnicity. This reinforces the typification of the subjects according to the classification systems of anthropology. While these annotations were not necessarily intended for the public, they express an unresolved tension given that form and composition of the portraits individualizes the subjects represented and encourages a connection with the viewer through the careful selection and staging of the visible, particularly the face as the center of affective life. At the same time, this is counteracted by relapsing in classificatory and typifying frameworks in the annotation. In this sense, sense images end up positioned between the possibility of humanization and identification and the continuous reproduction of a discourse of distancing and otherness. In this presentation, I have suggested a different approach to the study of Stern's Chaco series by reading the images not in relation to her other works, but in relation to a specific visuality of the indigenous people of the Chaco developed during the colonization of this region by the Argentinian state. These photographs introduce a significant break with this visuality through the creation of instances of empathic identification with the photographed subjects. The use of Noe second techniques allowed the affective expression of subjectivity which resists the objectification that we saw in visual anthropology and the ethnic postcard industry at the beginning of the 20th century. Thus, they suggest more ethical ways of representing indigeneity. In recent years, many photographers have turned their attention to indigeneity in line with a growing interest in and visibility of indigenous cultures in Argentina more generally. 
artists working on the Chaco, like Maria Sorson and Guadalupe Miles, share an aim to cast light on indigenous communities and their marginal situation and to produce more ethical portrayals of indigeneity that at the same time challenge the foundations of colonial visuality. Stern's work in this regard has been hailed as pioneer and as a fundamental reference when it comes to breaking with these modes of representation. As a final reflection, it is possible to ask what relevance these photos have today for the communities of the photographed subjects. Between 2005 and, 2000, uh, between two, uh, 2005 and 2009, Maria Giordano organized a series of events and workshops with members of the indigenous populations of Resistencia, whom she invited to view and discuss Stern's images in different settings, like schools, cultural centers, individual homes. Giordano confirmed the high emotional impact that the photographs had among the indigenous Chaco people, activating personal and collective memories that were intertwined with traditional forms of memorialization supported by oral transmission. For example, some, some people saw themselves as children, identified relatives alive or deceased, and recognized gone, space, uh, splay, uh, gone spaces and activities. They also tried to determine the ethnic belong, belonging of certain photograph subjects based on their physical characteristics, clothing, or other identity traits. In all cases, the images generated lively conversations and the act of reception unfolded collectively. The experiences described by Giordano confirmed that the rapture introduced by Stern in the visuality complex established during the colonization of the Chaco goes beyond the simple capacity of interpolation from a universalist humanism of those metropolitan audiences who constituted the primary target audience of the series. The images with their focus on the expressiveness and subjectivity of those portrayed, also have the ability to mobilize a way of intertwining visuality, orality, and memory in current Chaco indigenous communities. Through this process, the photographs allow an emotional encounter with the lost past and the possibility of the symbolic restitution of, of that very same past. Thank you very much.